get rolling. Cool. All right, Jack. Well, welcome, Christian. How Thanks are for you? having me, man. Uh, awesome. Yeah, man. It's a it's a pleasure to have you here, and obviously, I'm I'm excited to hear a little bit more about everything that you're doing. Um, I'm I'm excited to hear a little bit more about your history on on surfing. Uh, you're you're a big wave surfer. You're a teacher to kids, right? Trying to help kids be better in the water and, and how to navigate the ocean. And um, I'm really curious to hear a little bit more about the mindset and, and the preparation that, that it takes for for someone to ride a, a big wave like like you do and to just have the courage to go out there in, in these massive <laughs> bodies of water and just ride down this wave. Um, so... You're you're a Santa Cruz native, right? Yeah. Um, what was I'm it like, raised. grow? What was it like growing up uh, next to the water for you? Um. Yeah, it was just kind of from a really early age. It was um, I started junior, junior lifeguards at like six years old. I think that's when they start. And um, actually, to be honest, I wasn't a real big water person at all until mm-hmm. I was a little bit older. Okay. I was more into land sports, playing baseball and and. Uh, soccer and uh wiffle ball with anthony and uh the boys across the street anthony and linden and um but we our our parents got us into junior guards really early like six six years old so um and you know it was just like this slow progression i definitely i always had an uh, allure to the to the ocean but i i wasn't super comfortable i was definitely one of those kids that was like holding the junior lifeguard instructor's hand and they had to like help me swim around the buoy and um but you know, just every summer, just spent uh, spending the summers down at privates in Capitola, riding skim boards and and boogie boarding, and um, so I was definitely um, involved in the ocean. But <clears throat> it took a while to get comfortable right. out there. So now, Gooch or Anthony, uh, uh, we have a friend in common. I grew up playing soccer with him, and I remember him going every summer to to junior lifeguards what what was the purpose of junior lifeguards we didn't we didn't get to experience it here in watts mill um but i know a lot of you would go every summer every summer and i remember him yeah. by the end of the summer is just so tan <laughs> <laughs> right what was tan, tan and rip yeah what was the push-ups jumping jacks yeah what was the purpose of um it, can you can you describe a little bit more about the program yeah so ultimately the junior lifeguard program is a ocean safety and awareness program so teaching kids as young as six years old, um, you know, the power of the ocean and just, um, you know, one, how to respect the ocean and two, how to, uh, kind of exist out there. So, you know, starting to understand currents and, and waves and, and rip currents. And, um, you know, as you get older in the program, uh, you start getting into, you know, like surfing, they teach, you know, teaching surfing and, and paddle boarding and, um, and then, you know, underneath that, there's an entire uh, sport of surf lifesaving, which is like, you know, the competitions that for the people that aren't familiar with it, there's a, a, a sport that was essentially created in Australia called surf lifesaving. And so it was basically, you know, lifeguards way of testing themselves uh, in the ocean environment, you know, how quick you could get to a, a potential victim, you know, so things like run, swim, runs, running, you know, 100 yards up the beach, sprinting out around a around a salmon buoy sprinting back in uh running back up the beach 100 yards um uh you know the the red the paddle board became a big rescue device with the aussies as well as a surf ski which is basically like this really long ocean kayak um but yeah i mean so it's essentially you know just to get kids involved in the ocean really you know yeah it seems like um you know when they because uh, quite a few players on my team used to go to it, um, and they were always talking about the competition. It seemed like it was very competitive as well, right? Like it was, er- Spe- especially in Capitola. Capitola was always really big with competitions, and we did and we did really well for a long time in in the sport of surf life saving. So, okay. would you compete with other other towns? Is is that was there tournaments or what was that like yeah so locally here there's there's basically three different lifeguarding agencies you have um well three different junior lifeguard agencies you have capitola santa cruz and then state parks and they have three different beaches state parks so they have one at manresa um one at rio del mar and one at black's beach so they have you know three different beaches that are in under one 
agency and then Capitola Beach and Santa Cruz Beach. Okay. So we would compete with them locally and sometimes I think Half Moon Bay and even Lake Tahoe had a junior lifeguard program, which is pretty oh, right cool. They would, they would come down. Um, and then, yeah, so there'd be pretty much one, what was there, one tournament in the first session. So they're basically two four-week programs. So there'd be one competition um, at Capitola in the first session and then one at Santa Cruz, I believe, in the second session. Or maybe two competitions within okay. there. And then... Um, depending on how well you did for your beach, each beach would pick a regionals team. And so that'd be anywhere from, uh, we used to fill up like two big like Greyhound buses full of kids. So maybe 40 to 60 kids from each beach would go down and, um, compete in regionals. So that was like the state championships. Oh, so you'd really? go down and you'd, and you'd compete against Newport and Huntington beach. And, you know, Capitol has got a big program, you know, we have maybe 500 kids in the first session and 500 in the second session. And you go down and on a place like, um, LA County who has like three to 5,000 kids. Wow. And you just go, it, and it was just, it was a great time. It was some of the best times of my life. You know? So you were, so you were part of the region team as well. So I, I, I went to regionals a few years, me and Gooch. Gooch was really good at the beach flags. Mm. Just basically get kind of like musical chairs. They set up little batons in the sand and you lay down, um, facing the opposite way and you got to get up and sprint after the the flags are sitting in the sand and basically just eliminates you know goes down by one each time and that's kind of that was the the most exciting event that was the one everyone wanted to win and the most realistic really for a lifeguarding scenario other than not going in the water you know i mean all these games started from you know like how quick can you spot a victim in distress and get to it really quickly but over time it's become evolved and you know, become this really fun game. So that's awesome. And Gooch was like, Gooch was legit. I can't remember. He, he definitely took, I believe first and second a couple times in, in state. I don't know if he, I don't know if he won. I can't, I can't really remember back, but he was, he was definitely the best from Santa Cruz. Yeah. I, I remember Gooch. He's very competitive. Yeah. Very, very, very fast. Competitive. And he's very fast. He was, <laughs> he had a, he definitely had an athletic advantage at a, at a young age over everyone. No, totally. So, man. Well, and so what, what was that like growing up with um, growing up with your friends? It seems like a lot of your friends were very competitive, uh, all multi-sport, I believe. Right? Yeah. What, what, some, what were some of the sports that you were playing at a young age, and, and what was that like to grow up in an environment like that? I mean, I guess that kind of the first sports we were playing was, you know, backyard wiffle ball baseball. My, myself, Anthony, Lyndon, Anthony's little brother, um, my little brother, Scotty and then some of their childhood friends and our other childhood friends. But mostly the four of us would play wiffle ball in the backyard. So baseball was probably my biggest sport growing up, and I also played some soccer as well. Played on a competitive soccer team with, with Gooch, with the oh. Lionhearts. Oh, yeah, yeah, Coached by his dad, Paul, the legendary Paul Gooch yeah. and the Lionhearts. That was a good, that was good fun. Um, but, yeah, it definitely, I guess – um, yeah, it was just a fun thing to do, and it kind of, I guess, makes you competitive from a from a young age, you know? Right. <laughs> Trying to compete with your friends and beat them in all these different games, you know, this w wiffle ball or tennis or yeah. <laughs> well, well, a little background story on on all of them, right? Uh, Anthony Gooch was a Division One soccer player. Turned out to be a Division One soccer player. Uh, Lyndon Gooch is a professional <laughs> soccer player, right? European. Yeah. So and and he left at what age fifteen? Fourteen, yeah, fifteen? I, I wanna say, yeah, right around there. He was right. definitely yeah. You're you're a big wave surfer, so obviously there was a big influence there amongst each other, right? And obviously it's taking you guys a very, very far down the road. Um when did you start getting into surfing? So I you know, I, I started boogie boarding probably around the age of probably around kind of when I was getting into the water with junior guys around six and uh I met my you know my childhood uh, best friend Quinn at the time we met in kindergarten and Quinn was just like a little seal and he'd go out there every summer and wore a pair of trunks and a rash guard no wetsuit and he'd just go out and surf first first jetty down in Capitola for like I swear like four or five hours and he wouldn't get cold and um, so I started boogie boarding with him and, and we boogie boarded together for a long time probably 11 years 11 or 12 years and then right around 
uh, 18, right when I was graduating high school. So 17 going, turning on 18, I, I started standing up on the surfboard. So, oh, wow. Yeah. I so. would expect you, I thought you, you surfed a lot earlier. I mean, I, I'd always kind of done a little bit of surfing, you know, I did some, some longboarding and junior guards on the foam boards, but yeah, never, never really got into it until later on. Um, I was really into boogie boarding, which, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I, I loved, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't get off the boogie board. Yeah, it's fun. Oh, it we, is. We've tried it's it. It's amazing, man. And it's a lot of fun. Um, okay, and so at 18, you started riding at surfboard, and did you find yourself just pick it up right away? Um, how, how old are you right now? 31. Okay. I'll be 32 in September. So it's been about 13 years. Yeah. So, so. How, how did you go from 18 to 31 to not surfing to riding these big waves well i mean i mean i think boogie boarding had a big influence so with with boogie boards you're you're looking for different types of waves a lot of riding a lot of shore breaks that are really um you know like um for example you know like the the wedge down in newport beach so a really heavy shore pound and you're not really necessarily looking for these nice open faces that you are on a surfboard you're just looking for like the the meanest heaviest wave and so i think i think it actually helped a lot and i think that's why i started to get into big waves was from boogie boarding because boogie boarders just have a, a different approach you know they're looking for you know really hollow waves um uh just because i i don't even know exactly why but just that's kind of the nature of it and right since you're laying down you can kind of take a bit more of a beating so um, you know, even though I didn't actually start standing up until like 18, I mean, I was boogie boarding and, or I was, uh, snowboarding and skateboarding a lot. So, um, I felt like that definitely helped. Okay. And, 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 and just the thing with boogie boarding is, is that you get a, uh, a very intimate relationship with the ocean because you you know, your entire body's in the water as opposed right. to being on a surfboard, kind of being on top of the water and with a pair of fins. So, um, and that's, you know, that's a big part of you know, with my uh, kids program is, is starting out at boogie boarding. I really think it's kind of the, the best way to, to learn the ocean. Why, why is that? The, uh, you just, like I said before, it's, uh, it's kind of hard to explain, but it's just a more intimate relationship with the water. You know, I mean, the most, the most intimate way you could experience the ocean is body surfing, right? You're right. actually in the water like a seal or a dolphin right. and you're riding, connecting with the waves. And then you, you know, you add a boogie board, which is only a little bit of foam. So it gives you a little added speed. Um, and then once you get on a surfboard, um, it's a lot harder to maneuver around. And so, um, it's just, it's, it's a lot easier to kind of learn on a boogie and spend a lot of time just getting to know the water. I mean, that's the biggest thing with surfing, you know, the, the standing up, doing turns, riding waves. That's actually probably the, you know, it's obviously not easy, but that's the easiest part of the two. Really the hard part is, is just getting in tune with mother nature and just kind of understanding how waves work and where you need to be to, to ride waves. Right on. So if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we, it's just a different, it's a different experience really. Yeah. Yeah, we started getting in the water. After we, we did that surf lesson with you, you, you got us hooked on the water for a bit, and then we had moved to, to Aptos, and so we were right on the water too. And it was it was so hard not to go out. We're like, we're right here. But we didn't know yeah. how to surf, and so we were like, all right, let's go boogie boarding. And, and Dre and I actually started doing it. We did it for like a solid year that we were there. It was so much fun. Oh, that's awesome, um, man. And then we just stopped. And then we actually moved back, and then it got us away from the water. We got cut up with it was work. Right there in, in Rio Del Mar. We were Rio Del Mar, okay. but we'd go nice. to Capitola. We'd go. Okay. To, we started at Capitola Village, and nice. then we went out to Pleasure Point too. I don't know if they were very happy that we were there, but with the boogie boards. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> nobody, nobody can be upset. Capitola is the yeah. Um, what are um, and so you're you also you said you do snowboarding and you skateboard as well. Did you yeah. do that from a young age as well? Yeah, I got into skateboarding, yeah, probably around six or seven. So it was always skateboarding. Snowboarding was actually kind of my first love growing up, to be honest. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <it laughs> Again, I was kind of scared of the ocean, but I, I loved riding boards, you know. I loved skateboarding, and then I really loved snowboarding. My, my grandmother had a house up in Kybers, which is just south of uh, Lake Tahoe, south Lake Tahoe. So go up there, you know. I get on when I was younger you know we'd probably get 20 25 days in a year wow. on the weekends my parents would take me up there so 
Wow. That was pretty special. So you've been you've been on a board. You've been on some type of board basically your entire life. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, since I was yeah six or seven. And so now now getting into the big waves. How how did that how did that start happening? When when did you decide like how how does that process go? Do you just start going higher and higher and higher? What goes on in your mind when when you when you're deciding that you know I want to try something else? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely I and mean, you know it's it's a it's a progression for sure. For me, I think the biggest allure was at the time I was getting really into downhill skateboarding, um, so riding riding big hills and. You know, we'd usually do it at like two or three in the morning. I'd sneak out and go meet my friend, and we'd go bomb hills because obviously, your parents don't want you um, out late at night. But uh, and you know, there's there's no traffic at that time, yeah. so that was kind of the perfect time. So, and I, I just I remember one time I had this kind of this sensation of just going down this this hill and just just the speed and adrenaline of just like flying super fast down. And I was uh, I started to kind of equate it to you know, what it would be like to ride a big wave. And so from an early age, I started to, um, you know, just imagine like, okay, well, if I'm riding these big hills, what would it be like to ride a big, a big wave? And right about that time, this uh, documentary came out. It was just called Mavericks, a documentary. And I'd see a, seen a bunch of um, uh, movies about Mavericks. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, I guess that just kind of, that, um inspired the inspired me to want to go out and surf there and uh you know this was still during a time when i was boogie boarding and i think that's what kind of made me transition was downhill skateboarding and then you know from there it was you know learning to surf at capitola and then um you know learning to surf at steamer lane and middle peak and then um i went over to hawaii and i surfed waimea bay for the first time and then down in Puerto Escondido, down in Oaxaca. And so it was just this, you know, gradual progression over time. Um, and, you know, at the same time, I was competing a lot in, like, the, the surf life-saving sport, as I mentioned. I was probably 16 or 17 at that time and really getting into open ocean swimming and paddling. And um, so that was that was kind of what inspired me to, to take it to the next level and ride big waves, really. But, yeah, it's a definitely, it's a, you know, it's just a progression. It's like yeah. anything. Just get comfortable in waves of, you know, five to six feet, and then six to eight feet, and then eight to ten feet, and it and slowly gets more and more comfortable. You know, what's uh, what's the biggest wave you you breeded so far? Man, that's a that's a difficult one. Yeah, it's hard to it's hard to say. I've definitely I've definitely been in the ocean with waves in like excess of sixty feet though. Is that was that uh, in Portugal? Or, so was, or, there was, yeah, there was a couple times out at, in Nazare, and then probably the biggest surf I've been in was uh, Mavericks 2021, I think. And you know, just watching from the channel, there was, I mean, there was waves, you know, 60 plus foot, like up to 70 foot waves. Wow, just so big, you know. So what what is that <laughs> like, like uh, when you're in the water? What? It just doesn't look real, you know. You're just looking at it, and it's almost like you're. I don't know. It just seems like a fantasy world. You're just like, really? Is that wave breaking all the way? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's pretty amazing, but just beautiful. Yeah, and so in the in the first few times you you started taking these waves, I, I, there were some photos. Right, we were watching you, and I think it happened. A lot of that happened right after we met you, and um, we went out with you, and we started watching your page, and you know we're like, oh my god, he's going to Nazare, right? Uh, we saw you at Mavericks, and we saw some pictures of you taking some hits, <laughs> taking some slams. Yeah, yeah. What what is that like? <laughs> what is, what is it like being underwater like that? You know, it really it really just depends. Honestly, it's um, it really to be honest, it doesn't really matter the size of the wave because sometimes you fall in a, an enormous wave, and you you know as these waves are breaking, they you know as they break the sur- the surface of the water, they create these air kind of these air pockets. You know, so there's sometimes you, you think you're just going to absolutely die and you get kind of stuck in this area where it doesn't feel that bad and you're getting kind of tumbled around, but, um, it's, it's kind of mellow, you know, and you don't, you'd think you'd just come up with no arms and no legs, but you come up totally fine. And then there's been other times when, you know, just a medium sized wave, you know, five to 10 foot wave hits you and just, just wrecks you. So it's <laughs> just really depends, you know, Yeah. it really depends on the scenario and. 
um, yeah, sometimes it doesn't make sense, like, how people survive some of these wipeouts, but, you know, like I said, sometimes you just get, you just get really lucky, you know? Yeah. So. And have you found yourself in a, in a difficult situation before where you got scared or, you know, um, yeah, I think this last this last winter I probably had my my biggest scare. Well, really the two biggest scares, the the snowboarding injury, but then the uh the one in the ocean I was over in Hawaii during the uh Eddie I Cow swell. So the, you know, the Quicksilver in memory of Eddie I Cow, which is, you know, he's like the most legendary Hawaiian lifeguard of all time, big wave rider. Um and they, you know, they started this contest however many years ago and invite the best big wave surfers in the world. And the contest was going on. They hold it on usually like the biggest, the biggest day of the year, you know. Um, and I went to the uh, the outer reefs that day. So basically, you know, Waimea Bay, just you know, another part of the reef, farther farther out. There's a bunch of different waves on on Oahu. And um, I was out there, and I got out real early in the morning. Uh, my friend Evan. Um, had a jet ski and he said hey let's let's go out and try to get some some big waves in the morning and i was like all right let's go man because when it gets that big you know it's pretty i think a few people were able to paddle off the beach but it just gets you know you don't even want to be out there paddling without a jet ski and safety and all that so um stars aligned we had a jet ski and uh went out and uh, i remember his his friend we basically went out in pairs so me and my friend we had two skis four of us kind of switching off and um he gave me a helmet. He's like, wear this helmet. I'm like, I don't wear a helmet, dude. Like, you know, it's like, he's like, no, Nate, wear the helmet. So I, I put it on, caught this wave. And I remember, um, paddling back out and, and the, you know, uh, just thinking, well, I need to get a little bit deeper and try to get, you know, try to pull in the barrel on one of these, these big waves. And, you know, right when I had that thought, there was, you know, it was starting to get crowded. So I was like, you know, this is the time. There's literally three people in the water, but people are showing up. Like, this is the time to get a really good wave. And I remember just seeing the next, you know, big lump of water coming, and I just didn't even hesitate, just turned around, just started paddling, put my head down, and uh, I don't know what happened, but right when I got to my feet, like, the the whole thing just went wrong, and the wind kind of blew my board up from under me and kind of turned me sideways. And I just basically like fell backwards and like somehow spun around and dove, you know, probably like dove, I don't know, 20, 30 feet off the 50 foot wave and hit the bottom or hit the bottom of the water. And just like, that was one where like, I I just never experienced anything like that before. It just felt like, imagine what like a, a car accident would feel like, you know, yeah. just absolutely destroyed by yeah. the wave, pushed down super deep almost to the bottom. It feels like I'm almost to the bottom. Pulled all of my cartridges. So we have these vests that basically you can pull, like, you know, on the airplane, you pull the little rip cord and it blows up and usually it takes you to the surface. None of the cords went off. So I'm underwater, none of the inflation's going off and I'm just pinned on the bottom. And normally, you know, it starts to subside and it'll let you back up. But this one just kept holding me down, holding me down, holding me down. And I'm like, dang, at this point, like, uh, you know, the next wave is probably coming. But I was just, you know, trying to stay calm, come up to the surface. And uh, I remember almost thinking, like, I should just stay down here because the next wave is going to be on top of me. And I kind of broke my head through the surface, but I never took a breath. And as that happened, the next w- lip of the wave landed on my head and just sent me back down into that. So I basically had a two-wave hold down. And then uh, basically it was like, you know, moments from blacking out. Like, I was like, all right, this is it. So we're going to drown right now. And then I came up and jet ski picked me up. And so that was, yeah, that was pretty scary. You know? How long? How long? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that. I definitely changed my perspective a little bit because I was definitely a little reckless there for a while. How, how long do you think that that hold down was? Is, is there any video of it? or? What, um, there's what a video, yeah. Are? There's a video somewhere of it. Um, but I want to say, I don't know, it felt, it felt like about 40 seconds underwater, 30 or 40 seconds. Right. And so, so when you had that, so you, in the middle of all that, you you had this moment where you're like, this is it. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I mean, I I was feeling that like right after the first wipeout or after the, the initial impact, I was like, all right, this is, this is not good. (laughs) Yeah. And so obviously you rely on a team, right? At at this point, it takes, it takes a team for you to be able to go out there and, 
everything just has to go well, if, right? You, oh, you rely you rely a lot on these guys to come and get you. One hundred percent, man. <clears throat> so team sport for sure. Yeah, which is which is very interesting, right? Because you think when you think of surfing, it looks like an individual sport, but as soon as you get into big waves, it's like I've been wa- I watch a lot of it on YouTube, and it seems like it's there's a lot yeah. of people involved in this. Um, Not totally, man. What what type of training has to go into place for for all of you to learn how to take care of each other? Do you do you practice as a team or what what type of communication goes on? Yeah, so I mean, ideally, you know, in a place like in Nazare, there's you know certain teams, uh, different riders will have like, you know, everything from you know one person driving the jet ski, one person driving the the guy who's holding onto the rope getting towed into the wave and then they have a backup ski basically to like in case that guy can't rescue him and then a couple of the teams actually have like uh you know like doctors like an on-site doctor in like a little dune buggy on the beach and like have their own medical team so that's like ideally i ideally but some you know obviously not everyone has that kind of sponsorship money to have your own you right. know your own private paramedic on, on scene. So, uh, you know, over time, um, you know, these different areas have kind of, uh, you know, created, created these rescue teams, you know, like they have the, the Mavericks rescue team, for example, is kind of just a group of volunteers that, um, you know, has done a lot of water, water safety, you know, whether that's lifeguarding or, um, jet ski operator courses or, um, you know, just really experienced, um, with the jet ski and and doing rescues and they kind of just volunteer their time really. And, you know, everyone's able to kind of, you know, put in on, you know, give them some money on Venmo or whatever. But, um, and I think a lot of these places are starting to kind of create that, but, um, yeah. So in a perfect world, yeah, you have a team with, you know, (laughs) people that are practicing, you know, just for example, like, you know, how do you, how do you get an unconscious person onto a jet ski, you know, and you're practicing that in flat water, you know, how do you, you know, if, um, somebody gets a, an arterial bleed, you know, how are you going to stop that and then get them to the beach and connect with, you know, the fire department and lifeguards and all that. So that's in a perfect world. But like I was saying before, is that not everyone's capable of, of having their own team like that. So um yeah i don't yeah. so how do you how, yeah it sounds like obviously well that was my next question when it comes to to the sport right like how how do you fund your trips how does how does all of that happen because it looks like a storm hits right or, or a big swell comes in and all of a sudden you guys are on a flight and then yeah how does how yeah. does that work or hopefully you are right yeah well <laughs> otherwise you, know, you get the fomo and you're yeah, and I'm, you know, I, I'm, all my experience, like I said, I just, I just watch it on, on YouTube. There's a lot of guys who, who put their stuff out, and it seems like they're just jumping from place to place. I don't know if they're being sponsored totally. or not. I'm assuming they are, yeah. but how, how do you do it? Me personally, so I, I, uh, I run my business, the Central Coast Waterman, and uh, Wave Warriors program is the kids' summer camp. So, uh, essentially, you know, private, private surf coaching. And private kind of ocean safety classes that I teach are what fund my travels in the winter time. So I pretty much teach year round in the winter time. Once the time changes, I've been kind of taking uh, taking some time off and going to Portugal and and um, yeah. I mean, there's there yeah. I mean, that's that's kind of been how I've done it so mm-hmm. far. Yeah, between lifeguarding and just coaching people how to do it. And and how do you take care of all your stay? Do you have friends that, that you get in contact with? What what is what is that lifestyle like? Yeah, I mean it's definitely definitely a lot of couch surfing, you know, a lot of <laughs> yeah <laughs> friends and friends in Hawaii and Portugal and you know Portugal is really cool because they actually have a um, place called Car Surf, which is essentially it's like a dormitory for big wave surfers and the and the you know it's. 12 euros a night or something to stay oh, there wow. there's bunk beds big conventional kitchen uh full gym um and it's right near the wave so it definitely makes it a, a lot more accessible for people wanting to get into big wave surfing because yeah it can definitely get expensive you know yeah especially if you're doing the last minute flights so i've, I've been kind of you know last few years been 
you know, just trying to station myself in Portugal. Typically, you know, September, October, November, that's kind of a good a good time of year to go surf big waves over there. And so just kind of set myself up over there and then it becomes a lot more affordable that way. Yeah. But yeah, lo- obviously f- friends and family are a huge part of that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Staying in places like Hawaii where it's, you know what I mean? How do how does a how not, does a not surf cheap. yeah absolutely it sounds <laughs> you know and and, yeah. and you think about it like um, you think like a professional athlete right would would have a lot of resources and it sounds like maybe there's not as much um, but it's definitely a challenging road right to to be able to continue the love for the sport and especially when you have a specialty like yours right you have to get on a plane um, yeah you, you have to figure out your your stay. Uh, boards how does that work right how many boards do you bring with you what happens if one breaks what what is that process like um yeah i mean you definitely you definitely start breaking more boards and the, the bigger surf you get into <laughs> so, yeah um i've been leaving board I, I left basically i got lucky a couple of years ago i i brought like three big wave guns i brought two board bags three big wave guns and four uh regular boards to surf over in portugal I remember going to the airport and I was like, they're going to charge me so much money for this, but I'm just going to see what happens. And, uh, you know, I'm talking to a lady and she wanted to charge me like 17 or $1,800 to bring all my boards over there. And then, you know, as luck would have it, something happened and the system broke down and they were like, well, we're not able to charge you for your boards, but you can bring them on the plane. And so I basically like, once that happened, it was just, I left my boards there and um, I've kind of done that in a couple of places. I've got some boards down in Puerto Escondido. Um, so yeah, that's definitely how I've been doing it. Cause yeah. I mean, that's, that's usually the most expensive part, oversized luggage. Right on. Cause they want to, they want to charge you. That's a, that's expensive. A lot of Eight, 18. Brain. And how much does the board cost? I mean, that was kind of ridiculous. Yeah. I don't know. I sh- she was talking out of her ass but (laughs) (laughs) but yeah no it was i mean it was a lot of cargo you know it's probably just fuck 100 100 pounds of worth of boards 150 pounds worth of boards so i get it i mean it's right what does a what does a board run you for Uh, um do you you get yours custom built uh how does that yeah so i've I've gotten some i've definitely gotten some love over over the years vince broglio uh, he's probably given me my my best surfboards to date um and he's given me a good deal but yeah i mean Big wave guns these days can be upwards of you know fourteen fifteen hundred dollars for a surfboard. Oh wow! Just because it costs so much, you know the cost of materials and foam and everything's just gone gone up. So um, just for them to make the boards, you know, yeah. my friend was telling me just to just to shape a sh- uh, short board, which isn't even one of those big guns. It costs like five or six hundred bucks just to make it. Oh, if wow. you wanted to make it yourself, and they've obviously they put time and energy into right. this. They got to yeah, make yeah. some money, so. Yeah, that's expensive, you know, eight hundred to sixteen hundred dollars for a surfboard. Wow, depending it's on the pricey. size. No, it's pricey, man. It's not a. And then, and then the crazy thing is, you could literally buy that board and break it within an hour. You know, right. depending. And it doesn't do even necessarily have to be a big wave. You know, you just land on it wrong, or it hits the sand, or hits the rocks, or your leash breaks, whatever. You know. Yeah. So. Are you are you <laughs> able to repair them? Or you put them back, or or once a, br- a board breaks, is that is that the end of it? No, you can definitely repair them. Yeah, um, but even that, you know, that gets expensive too. Fixing boards. Yeah. Wow. But well, hopefully we can find you some sponsors. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be cool, man. Yeah, tell me that'd more about cool. about your your Waterman program. So you're working with kids, right? You do you do private lessons. What what is that like? Hmm. That's a lot of fun, man. I like yeah. I like working with kids. Yeah. I love, love working with kids. Why is that? Um, I don't know. Just because you know they're the the future of the planet, really. So it f- you know, it feels good to like be able to share your you know the information that you've you know you've obtained over the years, especially like in the ocean. You know, the place that I love the most, and be able to share that with them. You know, because you know when we were when we were growing up, there wasn't uh, the coaching thing wasn't real big. You know, so it was kind of mm-hmm. just. You just kind of go out there and, I mean, with a lot of sports, really, you know, yeah. just kind of like go out and figure it out, you know? Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which I think is, you know, important to have to have to go and do that, you know, and just fail and fail again and fail again. But it's also nice to have some guidance and, um, you know, over, over time, uh, people have helped me out, people like yourself, you know, with, 
you know, the training and everything. So it's just, just wanting to give back, I guess, really. And, uh, and just really see the progression of where the, where everything will go, you know? Yeah. How long? Especially with big wave serving, like what, you know, the kids I'm coaching now, if, you know, if some of them get into it, like what, what big wave surfing will be like when they're my age, you know? Right. In the thirties. So. Yeah, it's 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 awesome to pass down the experience, you know, the struggles that that you've gone through, and and make it easier for somebody else. Yeah, totally. Um, how long have you been doing this for? So I, I, you know, I started teaching junior lifeguards probably in 2017 or 18. So I worked two seasons as a uh, instructor, and then I ended up being a the junior lifeguard coordinator. So kind of just coordinating the whole program. Uh, me and my friend Katie, we co-coordinated the program for a year and then COVID hit. So let's say 2017, 18, COVID was what, 2019 and 20, when did, when is, when did it really start? 21. Yeah. So March, I think it was like 20, March 19. Say 2020 so summer programs were shut down and, um, you know, I'd been the coordinator the, the year before. So parents were kind of reaching out like, Hey, what's going on with guards? What's all this, you know? And kind of light bulb just kind of went off like well maybe I should just start my own program you know and uh, one of my mentors David just kind of gave me the the green light he's like yeah you should just start your own program and just put your own twist onto it you know so teaching the kids ocean safety awareness and then you know surfing and all the things I love to do you know paddling yeah. stand-up paddling kind of introducing this you know this waterman lifestyle so to speak you know which is just getting out on the water every day no matter what the conditions are you know whether that's stand-up paddling diving um whatever it may be so that's awesome man thanks man i it's, appreciate it it's been it's, a lot of fun and yeah yeah i think covid made um you know t covid was difficult for a lot of people obviously right yeah. but then but then we have people like you where the light bulb goes on and you see opportunity and you take it and, you know, sometimes it's a little yeah. bit scary, right? Because there's all these what ifs in your head. What if it doesn't work? What if, right? I don't know much about business. And I say this because I, I went through a similar stage. I mean, Envision was born in COVID as well. Really? So nice, it, was, it was the same timing as well. And so timing, man. It's a beautiful yeah, thing, isn't it? It's a, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it's, and it's just how you look at things, right? We can, I always look at totally. difficult moments like we can, we can see this difficult moment as an obstacle or we can see it as an opportunity, right? We can either let it bring us down or we can see an opportunity for us to grow. Um, that's, that's how I like to look at things. Um, how do you, how do you view obstacles? Yeah. Um, that's, <laughs> this is, it's, I've been dealing with that a lot lately yeah. and just with the first, you know, real injury that I've, mm -hmm. I've, ever really gone through in my athletic career you know I mean I've I've had a fractured hand before but that didn't put me back very long I mean this Achilles tendon partial tear has been you know it's been three months and we're now we're looking at three months of rehab so I've been wrestling with that yeah <laughs> yeah what's that a lot me lately man of, of obstacles you know and, and how do you overcome those so yeah what what's been that what's that um so you you had an injury right you you fell off you fell off the ramp you went off a a jump uh, snowboarding yeah i basically went off a jump and missed the landing so overshot the jump and then landed like in the flat part past the jump and <laughs> in downward dog and basically uh yeah tore my achilles tendon not not fully <laughs> ruptured but a partial tear so and and how's it been just just being injured what's what are what are the, some of the mind games you've been playing with yourself it's been pretty rough man Especially the first three months, because you know there there was no rehab, so there was no light at the end of the tunnel. Right. <laughs> just in a boot, just hanging out, sitting with your thoughts a lot, you know, yeah. and um, yeah, just I mean, trying to trying to tell myself that you know all there's a there's a uh, bigger purpose behind all this, you know. There's something to be learned from everything, right? Yeah. But it's easier said than <laughs> yeah, absolutely <laughs> than done, man. But what? Yeah. What are those uh what are those things you found along the way? Hmm. Just that, you know, surfing and snowboarding isn't you know, the only thing in life, you know. I think for a while there, you know, it's it's pretty typical of um 
I think anyone that's really trying to get after it, you know, it's, it's easy to get just this tunnel vision of just like, I want to get better at surfing and ride bigger waves and hit bigger snowboard jumps and better and better and get to a point where it's like almost obsessive, you know, and you're kind of put other things in life on the back burner, you know, whether that for me was like, you know, even just like the business or, you know, you know, whatever it may be. Yeah. Family, friendships, you know, it's just kind of, it's this one quest to just like pursue better and better and better and better. And, um, you know, it takes something like an injury to really sit back and be like, wow, you know, there's a lot more to life than, you know, and and at the same time, you know, I feel lucky that I, I have that, that, um, that passion, you know? Yeah. So it's not necessarily, you know, that bad of a thing either that I'm so obsessed with surfing and stuff. (laughs) It's a good thing, but just, you know, having a little more balance and, and, uh, not having to be so, you know, determined to, to, you know, because for me, it's always just been proving to myself something, whether that's, you know, I mean, a perfect example is, you know, right before that injury happened, I was getting really sketchy. You know, I'd taken a day off the day before and just just completely tired and just wrecked. And I should have just called it in, you know, and should have just listened to my body and been like, hey, it's time to call it a season and just you know go home and focus on, you know, just getting back in shape for the next season. But in my mind, it was like I couldn't accept the fact that no i'm not tired i can't be tired there's no way i can do this and you know yeah all the signs were there so go hard it's been a big thing yeah go hard (laughs) but also you know listen listen to your body you know and get get in tune with how you're feeling you know are you are you actually ready to go and push yourself or do you need to like sit down and take a rest yeah (laughs) well it sounds like both of your incidents right you were talking about your other um big wave incident that you had and and you were saying like things were getting reckless right and you still did it um it was a it was a moment for you to kind of reflect and and see what was going on and it sounds like this one is one of those two where it makes it makes you reflect and it makes you become more aware of of how you're feeling and the signs that life is throwing at you or your body's throwing at you and you know i think that's where a lot of the growth comes though right it was like you say like you said before, it's, there's nothing wrong with being determined and there's nothing wrong with demanding more about yourself. But you learn to become more aware. And and as you do that, I think you have this these two sides that you can, there's this switch that you can always turn on. Um, but you also got, have to know when it's time to let off, let off the gas a little bit, right? And oh, totally, man. And it makes you realize, like I said, that, like you said, surfing, surfing isn't everything um, because it can easily be, you know, taken away. Um, wow, and 100%, so, hundred percent, man. Very it, quickly. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and it, and it happened, it happened to me and we talk about, we, I talk a lot about losing your identity. It becomes a very challenging moment in life when, when a person loses their identity, right? Especially uh, athletes, I think that's it's a very difficult moment. Um, injuries, retirement, right, or not making it to the next level. Uh, we see it a lot in in Division One athletes. We see it a lot in professional athletes that have, you know, career-ending injuries. Um, and so, obviously, there comes this moment where we have to search for something else, right? And it sounds like you've you found that that teaching is is what gives you purpose and what moves you forward as well being able to push some of your experiences onto other kids is that is that how, man. is that how you feel yeah 100 percent, man yeah yeah absolutely um and that's something that you know hasn't been taken from me because i've you know through this injury been able to still teach obviously in those first few weeks i wasn't doing anything but um yeah it definitely gave me a new appreciation you know for you know, the things I do have, still being able to work, still being able to, you know, feed myself. And I mean, you know, I live a beautiful life living on Pleasure Point, you know, like, um, just giving me a lot more, you know, gratitude, like I said, for the things I did have, you know, because it's, it's very easy. It was very easy there for a while to just constantly want more, you know, it's like my life's beautiful, but I wasn't being grateful for those things. It was like, no, I need to like get on Red Bull level and start making Red Bull money. And once I get there, then I'm going to be happy. That's going to like make me happy or once I, you know, whatever it may be. Um, 
And, you know, being taken away, away from that, it's like, okay, well, you can't do any of that now. You can't pursue your passion. But you still have a ton of other great things. you got got great friends, great family, you live in a beautiful area. you got to teach people and um, do what you love, essentially. So, um, And it took a little while, you know, to kind of for all that to come forward. But, um, you know, that's just been kind of the focus the last couple of months. Yeah. <laughs> being grateful, you know, for yeah. what you do have because it can all be taken away. Yeah. So, yeah, that's injuries are a tough moment. <laughs> I've had a lot of them and they're no fun. No, man. Um, but how have it, you kind of dealt with those? Um, you know, I struggled, man. I mean, I, if I look back at my college experience, I had four season ending injuries. So I don't think I was at, at a stage in my life where I could. I was able to handle it with them, you know what I mean? Um, I was away from home, and and it was a very difficult moment for me because I remember my first year when I had my first injury. Um, as a freshman, right, I, I move across country. You go on a full-ride scholarship, so you're like, I'm doing it. Yeah. I'm, I'm doing the big things that I, I, I always set myself to, and so you have that big achievement, and then – you get on the starting team as a freshman, which is, you know, not very common. Um, and so once again, another win. And, and once again, it's your identity. This is, this is who you are. You're, you're, you're a striker, you score goals. And, you know, when, when that was taken away from me, it was really hard at that, at that stage. So for me, it was distractions. For me, it was alcohol. For me, it was partying. And, and that's how I dealt with it. Right at that at that time, and it was telling myself that everything was okay, and and I just became part of the party life, and you know I got I got sucked into that world, um, mm. which eventually led to more injuries in the future. Right next year, three games in, broke my foot. Wow. Right, and so, well, like you said, spending that time away from from your team and. Because once you get an injury in, in, in a team in a team sport, you're no longer with the team. You're in the rehab room. You're in the pool. Mm -hmm. You're doing all this other work by yourself, and you're no longer a part of you know the joke that happened at practice, or you know you start becoming just just a bystander on the side, and that was very difficult. So I just I I I, I lost control when I was in college and. You know, I ended up getting kicked out of school, which was the next that summer of that second year. Um, went to another school, had to sit out a year for that for that reason. So there was a lot of sitting out for me once once I got to the next level. Um, then the fourth year, tore lower ab. My fifth year, my last season, the day before preseason, I broke my foot again. Oh shit! Back to back. To back and that was it that was my college experience so for me it was I never got out of that injury and it was it was very difficult it was it was tough you know I lasted you know and I talk about this a lot now like I've used this story now to push me forward and I also work with kids and that's one of the biggest reasons because I've made a lot of mistakes that I hope a lot of kids don't right and the only way that I can do that is by sharing my story and, and give them, giving them a point of view because when I was younger, nobody nobody told me anything. It was like, here's your scholarship. Have fun. <laughs> See you later. Yeah. And, and going from a small town to, you know, this world, this different world, is, it, was, it was very challenging for me. Um, but how do I deal with them now? I think for me – now that my son was born, it completely changed my perspective on life. And I was telling you earlier how I got away from the water, right? Like we were going in the water, and as soon as Luca was born, I stopped getting in the water. And I and I knew because I was not being safe, like I was being sketchy, right? Like I'm not the best swimmer. And then I was thinking, not only am I putting my life at risk, but I'm also putting other people's lives at risk. And I'm also chancing the opportunity of my son losing his father, right, because he gets in trouble or something. Um, so it, so it made me more aware of, of the actions that I'm doing. And I don't, I don't take a lot of risk anymore, right? Like my risks are more, 
calculated, uh, where before yeah. it was like, let's go. <laughs> so no, totally. that's, I think that's what I was, I was talking to you about is you just, you collect all this data and then you just start becoming more aware. Like these are, these are my boundaries. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I'm always pushing. Right. Yeah, and, and yeah, you are. there's this individual that's never going to die inside of you. There's this, there's this edge that you always want more. You have to, you have to keep pushing. Yeah. Um, and I just try to push that onto the, to the younger generations as well. I think that's a big, that's a big goal of mine is, is to show kids that if you just keep working, keep working, keep working, eventually, eventually you'll get to the next level. You don't have to be the best, but it's, it's about the discipline and it's about the consistency that it comes down. And, you know, it's, it's falling forward. You're going to continue to fail all the time. Yeah. You know. It, it never ends. <laughs> like I'm, right. I, I'm looking forward to my next failure, right? And it was like I was telling you, there are opportunities now. So you you change that that mindset and the way you look at, at your failures, and now they're just opportunities. Whenever I'm going through a struggle now, all right, I'm about to grow. Something is about to happen. Something big is about to happen, right? COVID happened for you, and it took you out, and then all of a sudden you're like light bulb turned on this is my opportunity to grow my business right um, oh, totally man you're probably going through a struggle right now and it's probably time to start really focusing on the business and seeing you know how you can grow it or building building connections right networking finding yeah. ways that you can make surfing a little bit more affordable or easier for you um, but i think there's a lot a lot of positives that are going to come out of, of this injury for you. How do you feel? Yeah, I think so, man. hundred percent. I've already kind of seen them, you know? Yeah. Just in that regard, like you were saying, I've been focusing a lot more on the business. Yeah. And you know, parts of the business that I didn't really want to do. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. It's teaching's fun. Yeah. You know, I enjoy teaching, but then there's, you know, the business taxes and yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's the challenging part. And just you know, getting equipment and and you know, focusing on the program, like you know, really building like a good curriculum. You know, that kids are actually gonna like really learn some stuff. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Are you are you finding are you finding help for that? Are are you? Yeah. Connecting yeah, yeah. with with other people to figure out how to totally. how to grow the business. Yeah, totally, right. man. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I've had a lot of, a lot of help this summer just as far as like running it, mm. um, you know, with, with other instructors and stuff like that, especially when I was kind of down and out. So. Right. <laughs> so you, you have some employees, you got some employees. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Look at that. So you you know, three, three to five employees, not, a, not, I mean, very, very minimal work, you know, for right. the most part, I, you know, me and, and, uh, my, my helper, Anthony. So, right on. yeah. And so now, now you're know? providing opportunities to others, right? Yeah, trying to. So that's yeah, awesome, yeah. man. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, what is what is what are your plans? What where do you plan to take this? Do you, do you see it growing? Do you see it? You know, being at multiple beaches, mo multiple towns. Wh wh where would you like your program to go? Yeah. Um. Cause I haven't thought too much about that. Um, I'd like to just, you know, continue the, the the summer camps and and after school program and just you know it's been it's been growing kind of organically, which has been nice. Um, I guess where I'd really like to see it is is figuring out ways to get some funding to um, create space for uh, you know at risk youth and and underprivileged youth to come and be able to experience experience the program. You know. Yeah. I think that's really where I'd like to kind of take it, you know, whether that's turning it into a, you know, a nonprofit 501 or having an aspect of a 501 3C, you know, to to give opportunity to, you know, other kids. So that's um, amazing. And I think, you know, like we talked about, I think it's just a matter of like connecting with some of the school districts. Right. And yeah. tell them like, hey, this is, you know, this is what I can offer. And and then, you know, reaching out to, 
you know, investors or whatever that want to help in, in that regard. So, yeah. That's yeah. Where, that's where I'd really like to take it, you know? Well, well yeah, I think what, I'm, what I'm, you offer is amazing. Thanks, man. Right? You do, because right now you're currently, you have a free program as well, right? Yeah, so I, I, I uh, my friend Nick Hart runs uh, Flow Loves You Foundation, which is, um, which is a nonprofit, and they take kids, you know, biking, skateboarding. They have a sa- sailing program, um, a lot of really good stuff. So um, I run their after school program Fridays, four to six for anyone who's interested, uh, middle and high school. So middle and high school kids, but yeah, free free surf lessons down there at Thirty Eighth Avenue and and uh, Capitola. So. Every Friday? Every Friday. We're taking a break until I think beginning of September. But yeah, for the most part, every Friday. Right on. So, yeah. And, and but, right now with your PT, when when do you expect to go back to surfing? It sounds like I'm, I'm at about the 13-week mark now. So probably another 11 weeks. Probably looking at six months total until so end of end of October I'll be surfing again probably. Right on. I mean, we'll see. Right now, it's just really focusing on getting this thing strong. Yeah. And it's made a lot of progress. Um, you know, Ryan Ryan had a lot of good things to say about, you know, that it just feels strong. And Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful now, you know. Good. And it's nice to get back in there and, you know, starting to do some weightlifting and stuff, just yeah. real mellow stuff. So that's great. I look man. forward to getting back in, in with you, man. And yeah. Y- we got to go back out on there. A, training regimen you know so that's another you know good thing about this period of time you know having you know some time to kind of recollect myself and get myself in good fitness you know for the upcoming winter so yeah like you said there's always a silver lining yeah you're gonna come back stronger (laughs) well i know you were you were so man and you are you were already going that route right like you started focusing you came to me asking about training and strengthening and more conditioning and paying attention to your nutrition so totally man um and and that was that was really helpful i really appreciate it yeah i mean i'd already just from the few things we talked about you know with that um you know the extra carbs and stuff like that i mean it was just even just those little switches you know yeah makes makes all the difference in the world you know yeah so we got to make sure we fuel the machine. Fuel the machine, yeah, man. Yeah, well, it's yeah. awesome, man. Well, I'm I'm very grateful for you being here, and you know, it was a it was a pleasure to have an opportunity to talk to you, and once again, see you again. Yeah, I'm always I'm always excited to see you. Yeah. Um, I think you you have a very interesting story, and uh, to this day, I still can't understand how you decided to go down those big waves, man. It's uh, it's. I, I admire a lot of what you do and, you know, obviously working with the kids, uh, huge respect to you, man. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, man. Thanks for, thanks for having me on here. Absolutely. I feel the same way about you. Thank you. So. It was a pleasure, man.